Rosario Quiroz Villarreal, Director on TNTP's Policy and Advocacy Team. At TNTP, we recognize the transformational power of centering the student experience and voice. We've witnessed it shift the game in the research for our 2018 report, The Opportunity Myth, where students helped us understand what real tangible changes school systems can make to provide more students with school experiences that are meaningful, honor their aspirations, and give them a chance to meet their goals. We are committed to continuing to uplift, honor, and make space for student voice. In that spirit, I am so excited for tonight's conversation, the first of a three-part series where students are taking over TNTP's Passing the Mic platform to share their vision for what's presently needed to ensure they are equipped by their education for economic mobility. We have partnered with Our Turn, a nonprofit organization with over 5,000 student members, mobilizing, organizing, and leading to ensure student voices are heard. This three-part series will be facilitated by Tamara Morgan, a senior high school student in Atlanta, Georgia, and executive fellow for Our Turn. She'll lead through conversations with fellow students that will provide insight on what students are currently thinking and get district and school leaders to clear action steps to make space for student voice. Tamara, thank you for your leadership. I'm looking forward to learning from you and your peers. With that, I'll pass it to you. Hello, everybody. It's so great to have everyone here. My name is Tamara Morgan. I am 18 years old and an executive fellow with Our Turn from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm joined by today with Sid Fryer and Jalen Adams for our final conversation conversation on TNTP's Passing the Mic. It's honestly no question that student voices need to be elevated and heard. It's so easy for adults to say that children are the future, but we never get a chance to talk about what would be good for our futures. So far, our turn has uplift, uplifted student voices discussing the current moment in education, the importance of student engagement, and the demands of the student agenda. Today, we'll talk about what's next how schools and districts can make sure they're walking, the talk, they're walking the talk on student voice. What are the concrete things that we can do to make sure that we know that the youth care? With all of that being said, I would love to get to know these inspiring and amazing students we have here on the call today. Sid, I'll start with you. Great, thank you so much, Tamara. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Sid Fryer and I am a senior at South Mecklenburg High School in Charlotte, North Carolina. I originally got involved um, with our turn about two years ago, actually, which is kind of crazy to think about, but um, I got involved as part of the One State, One Rate campaign we run here in the Charlotte metro area, which is around um, securing tuition equity for undocumented and DACA students. Um, and I got involved in our turn really because a peer just, addressed to me, you know, the incredible work that was being done around student organizing and issue advocacy really across the country. And as someone who has had the privilege to benefit from a meaningful educational experience, I know how important that can be. Um, I am a strong believer in the fact that education is the foundation of everything and that if we have a well-educated and, and, and informed society, um, then we can really accomplish great things and, and work together. So um, I'm really excited to be here to uh, discuss, you know, better ways that we can elevate student voices and, and walk the talk around effective student engagement. Um, and with that, I'll pass it to Jalen. Thank you so much, Sid. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jalen Adams, and I am a senior at Olympic High School at Charlotte, North Carolina. My grandparents came from Puerto Rico speaking very little English, and my mother never went to college. Because of this, I was taught early on the power of education. I was taught education gives you opportunities and options, and you don't just learn about the Great Depression or the Civil War the likes of that. You also learn skills like critical thinking and empathy and the ability to have meaningful discussions with people who might not look like you or even act like you. Because of this, I started to work at our turn. I started in October of 2021, so a lot less time than Sid, but I am working as a local organizing fellow to help push campaigns in North Carolina. Right now, we're fighting for tuition equity across the state. Sid, you touched on this, the one state, one rate campaign, and I'm hoping the spirit of this campaign will travel the whole country if possible. That's so great. I'm so glad you guys are here. You both have amazing stories and I'm so excited to get into it with you guys. Okay, so there is no time like now to elevate the voices of students. 
our turn and organizations across the country have worked to champion movements around student voice. In a time as pressing as now, though it is important to ensure these movements are fulfilling their goals of authentically engaging and serving students. To start us off, we'll have each guest share one thought and effective student engagement. So Jalen, I'll start with you. How can organizations, schools, and other decision makers walk the talk in terms of, of, terms of effectively engaging students? Thank you, that's such a good question. I think they need to be on the ground. Uh, too often administration organizers or even just decision makers will speak very conceptually. My high school just had a new principal and I won't say any names, but no one saw him for weeks upon him getting the job. I couldn't name more than one administrator, and I definitely could not tell you the last time the school board has spoken to the district as a whole, not just generally dishing out commands. I rarely see organizations consistently paneling or even polling for the student body and their opinion on things, which is definitely why I'm so glad to be a part of the work at our turn since we do both of those things. But definitely, if you are going to say you advocate for students, you need to be down there speaking with students and in schools. Yeah, I, I think that's such a great example, Jalen. And I think all I would add on is how important it is to meet students where they're at, right? Like we, um, you know, I think as people that are involved in organizing, we recognize that there are opportunities to plug in. But a lot of times there are students that are passionate about these issues and recognize inequities, but just don't have an outlet to express that. And so I think that if there are certain programs or like even just administrators and school principals, like you said, Jalen, that are really getting in classrooms, um, speaking to those marginalized communities about the issues that are affecting them. Like, for example, South Mech, the school that I go to, um, I, I want to say that we have around 1300 English language learner students and experience in like, you know, tutoring in classrooms and working with different, you know, students of that group. Um, they're often just an afterthought. And I think that if we're able to develop those mechanisms where there's um, folks working in schools or even in programs outside that are coming to classrooms and saying, how can we, you know, um, help around the issues that you're facing? How can we get your feedback? Um, even if it's just something as simple as getting student feedback on social media. I think the more that we can reach out to students where we know they are, where we know they're active, and where we know that they're comfortable, the better. Because ultimately, um, while it is on students to kind of advocate for themselves, I would say that those in the school system and stakeholders definitely have a responsibility to reach out to us to ensure that the work they're doing as educators is serving us. Right, Sid, I'm absolutely glad that you brought up the fact that, you know, youth are getting um, around to talking about the issue because the next part we're going to be talking about is what do the youth actually care about? So once again, thank you both for reflecting on the ways we as students can be effectively heard and not just seen. As we all know and have discussed, the pandemic was incredibly difficult on students from a wide variety of backgrounds leading to learning loss, feelings of isolation, depression, anxiety, and so much more. Youth of color have been most impacted, including in being overrepresented among the 140K children who have lost a caregiver on top of students of color previously experiencing high rates of mental health concerns prior to the pandemic. Let's do a quick, a quick blitz around what issues matter the most around students you know. So what three issues matter most to students? Sid, I'll start with you and then Jalen, you can go right after. Sure. I think that one um, that has become increasingly prevalent, prevalent, excuse me, and you touched on this, Tamara, is mental health supports in schools, um, because that's something that affects literally everybody. If it's not you, you know, you have a friend that's struggling with mental health supports. And I think that as somebody who goes to a really large school um, with over 3,300 students, I can just see the ways that students are not being fully supported, whether they're slipping through the cracks or they don't know the resources that they can access. I think increasing Increasing communication around mental health and just allocating more funding towards it really is something that, that students really care about. Um, and actually, while I think of two more, I might pass it to Jalen so we can kind of just go back and forth. Thank you. I would definitely say equitable resources. I You can have wonderful teachers who, who strive for their students, but if they don't have the pencils, if they don't have the, the chalkboard, if they don't have paper, really, what can you do about it? I think if we're going to be 
school is a place where we should be learning and you can't really learn without textbooks. And if the textbooks are old and, and out of date and, and are peeling back off the side, then we're telling students not only that their education really is not important to us, but we're also doing them this, the disadvantage of giving them poor education. And really, as you said earlier, Sid, I understand the, the value of a meaningful education. I, I wanna go higher, I wanna, I wanna get my, graduate degree, my PhD, and so on. But for the students who really have only had the books that are falling apart and the computers that have missing keys, they really don't see the value in all of that. For sure. And I think one other thing I'll touch on is, um, you know, and I know we'll go into this more, but the work that Artern's doing around um, culturally accurate curriculum and um, culturally inclusive pedagogy and all that stuff, I think is huge for students because, you know, being the ones who are sitting in the classrooms, we're familiar with the you know, falsehoods and whitewashing and the colonizing of the curriculum that we're being taught. And I think it's really important for students to see that their identities, their cultures are affirmed in what we're learning. And whether it's in history classes, whether it's increasing sensitivity around conversations in English classes, culturally inclusive teaching practices, making sure that, you know, the, the actual education that's coming from the educators that we're, you know, so conditioned to admire and respect and listen to are ones that affirm the identities of students actually sitting in classrooms. Um, and I think that's something that I've heard quite a bit from my peers. Jalen, I don't know if you have the same experience. No, absolutely. My school in particular is predominantly black and brown. And it's always a very alarming experience when you have this class filled of people of color and all you're learning about is a white man who you have absolutely no connection to. And it's definitely humbling sometimes to, um, to hear the dialogue that's kind of exchanged between students at my school where it's like, oh, at this time, I would have been an inventor. I would have tried to help make the light bulb. And another student that looks like me is like, oh, well, I don't think I would have been able to do that. It's definitely very sad. And moving forward, I definitely think that African-American history, the history of immigrants, Hispanic history is all incredibly important and essential to students and also making sure that they wanna show up to school and learn about interesting things about themselves. Exactly, and not to you know harp on this too much, but I think you brought up a really good point, Jalen, in that in our school district in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools, you can take electives if you choose around African American history or Latin American studies. But I think that making it part of that core history curriculum that all students are learning, having an ethnic studies requirement um, is so important. And if we're able to kind of just spread that message and ensure that all students are learning about these histories that are so deeply valuable to you know making informed decisions and just being culturally conscious and aware, the better. So. Thank you, Sid and Jalen. You guys both, both brought up some amazing points and things that people are able to take and run with. And now I think that was a good foundation to start um, talking about concrete pathways to make all of this happen. One of the most promising prioritizations for gathering student feedback nationally, state and district plans to determine the distribution of 122 billion through the American Rescue P Plan ESSER funds. The Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights has released data on the impacts of the pandemic on our, on our nation's schools. Their report reveals that COVID-19 has deepened disparities in outcomes and access to opportunity, especially for students of color, multilingual learners, students with learning and thinking differences, and the LGBTQIA students. Before states were allowed to dispute ARP ESSER funds, they had to engage in gathering stakeholder feedbacks. This looked differently in different states, with some like Rhode Island and Colorado completing holistic comprehensive assessments and programs to reach families and education stakeholders across the state. Other states were inconsistent, lacked transparency, and saw little results from our feedback efforts. I have two questions for both of you. Sid, I'll start with you. While stakeholder engagement process processes for planning to use for the use of APS or funds may have had mixed results, how can we have and use this moment and this opportunity as a vehicle for change? Yeah, thanks, Tamara, for that question. Um, I think that, you know, 
even though the ARP ESSER quote unquote experiment may not have panned out exactly as a lot of students and stakeholders would have liked it to, that just shows that you know, the current administration and, and folks that are working in education now really are starting to put an emphasis on student feedback and student principles. And so I think that just lends itself to the moment that we're in and the vehicle for change that we're really in. And so if we as students can use this time to just plug into any, um, you know, public forums or, or, or do any storytelling around the issues that we're facing, the better, the, the, you know, there are so many opportunities, I think, for students to get involved with their communities, whether it's speaking at school board meetings or making connections with the administrators in their schools, things like that. I know that um, something that's been on our minds a lot at our turn is looking at, you um, student members of school boards like we have one here in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools where they're not a voting member on the school board but they're just kind of a student representative who's there to one bring feedback to the school board but also take some of that you know messaging and important information that we as students need to know and bring it to us in a way that is not confusing and like covered in red tape and you know like all, all that stuff that I think a lot of government, um, not not quote government, but government, you know, processes can be like. Um, and that has proven, at least for me, to be like a really effective position. You know, the the student advisor last year was really active on Instagram. And I think that just goes back to talking about meeting students where they're at. Like we were able to provide feedback to her directly through Instagram DM or whatever. And she was able to take this information that was really crucial for us to know and put it on her story. And it was something that we were able to watch and engage with and just be um, really, I think, fluid and flexible with. And so I really appreciated that. And I think the more that we can use this opportunity to say, you know, hey, folks are listening and, and care about the things that students want to see happen um, and, and kind of capitalize on that and just use every opportunity we have to elevate our voices and to um, engage in positions that are kind of designed for student feedback, the, the better that ultimately we'll be off. So those are my thoughts. That's a great uh, statement. You made a statement saying that meeting students where they're at, I really think that um, really the context of the whole um, the whole series, you know, just getting student input because you, it's not often that you hear adults say or ask students, what is it that you want, you know? So but anyways, Jalen, your question is, after ESSER funds are distributed, how can decision makers continue to engage students and young people and be held accountable? Thank you. As I mentioned before, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools does have a student advisor, although they don't they don't vote, they still are very active in the meetings and can give their opinion as they want to. Um, personally, I'm also pretty involved in that. So I have some insult in the fact that school officials tend to come to the student council of the district. And they will ask for our feedback about specific issues. We're allowed to make entire proposals or um, just entire feedback forms about specific issues and then give that to them. But this also brings me back to uh, kind of the latter half of the question. Um, it's very close to the work I already do with our turn. We are in the process of remodeling the Effective Educators campaign, which uses student evaluations to, to assess the quality of teachers. Because of this, we've had a lot of conversations surrounding how exactly we gather and examine our information. And in the end, I believe transparency is the most important thing for holding decision makers accountable about pretty much anything. I agree with Rhode Island and Colorado's approach, um, you know, comprehensive assessment programs to reach stakeholders. But at the end of the day, I think publishing those reports and pushing them out to families and students is one of the most effective ways we can hold really anyone accountable. Because, of course, they can sit at the table, they can hear our complaints, they can take our proposals. But at the end of the day, I want to report saying, hey, this is what we're going to take from your from your um proposal this is what we're going to do about the problem you're complaining about here and at the end of the day everyone should know what's happening um if you're being inconsistent you can do that but now the stakeholders have access and can see exactly where those funds are going this is also really great because it shows that the funds aren't really the problem but really how people are using them and that is exactly how we get people to go and vote for who's going to be on our school board right you guys your responses are like on fire. I am absolutely loving this and I'm sure the audience will too. Um, but as you guys know, there has been a nationwide outcry, outcry around the need for more culturally inclusive pedagogy, just as you were saying, um, Sid, in the last question, ranging from curriculum to teaching practices. 
we know teachers of color make a huge difference in impact on students of color. In public schools nationwide, white educators represent over 80% of the teacher workforce, and they are serving a population of over 50% of students that identify as Black, Indigenous, or other people of color. Research has also pointed out that all students benefit from having a teacher of color and students of color are especially likely to succeed in a classroom led by teachers who look like them and share their background. Sid, my question to you is, have you ever had a teacher of color make an impact in your life? Yes, and I can share on that, but I definitely like to hear Jalen's thoughts too. Um, I guess for more context about my educational experience, I went to a K through eight Spanish language immersion school um, and the majority of our education there were from Hispanic or Latin American backgrounds, which I think just made such an impact around really immersing students in that community, right? Like you're not just there to learn the language, but you're you're learning the culture and the customs and the values. And I think that that experience particularly shaped me so much and coming up obviously from kindergarten to eighth grade you know when you're you have that um, additional sense of of cultural awareness when you're just around um, folks that that are that are different than you but that are imparting these values on you that are kind of different than what you already know I think is so enriching and an experience that I hope every student is able to go through but I know that a lot aren't um, and so that I think shaped a lot of my um drive around education equity, but then also kind of getting to high school. I, in all transparency, I, I had had very few black teachers growing up. And then finally, when I got to um, my junior year, my AP um, English language and composition teacher was a black woman. And she, um, I thought just made incredible strides in like reshaping the way I thought about English literature. You know, it wasn't just like an English class where we're learning the same, you know, texts over again and we're analyzing the same authors. She brought a completely fresh perspective, um, you know, encouraged us to have challenging conversations about challenging texts that maybe made some students uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, I think it promoted our, our critical thinking and, and bettered and bettered us. Um, and she definitely brought this energy. It was, it was virtual. My junior year was all virtual last year. So um, just having her as kind of a bright spot in our day, you know, when she was encouraging us to think critically, but at the same time, just being um, a real support system during a year that was particularly challenging. I thank her a lot for that. Um, and, it, and it is definitely opened my eyes to just some new ways to think about like English, which is a topic that and, and a subject that so many students have to go through, but um, is so fresh when you're learning it in a new way from new eyes. I completely agree with that. Uh, I think in the eighth grade, yes, it was the eighth grade. I remember this very specifically. In the eighth grade, I had the pleasure of being taught by the wonderful Miss Mayor. Um, I will probably send this to her, so <laughs> she will definitely be seeing this. But in all transparency, and although it's a little embarrassing, I had never heard about Emma Till or the case of Emma Till. And mm -hmm. she bought it all by herself, was able to purchase 20, 30 books, just detailing every graphic grisly detail. And um, at 13, was it a little, um, hard for me to hear, definitely, but it was also probably one of the most important lessons of my life. I had never heard about how it was such a catalyst for the civil rights movement. I had never heard about the strength of his mother to, to really sit there and be able to kind of craft every sentence in front of an all white jury and then how they, how they went out and then they only spent 30, 45 minutes deliberating and then came back and set the men free. It was awful to hear, but it was definitely one of the most important lessons I have, ever, I have ever learned. And I will always be grateful for that. And I really think everyone should have that experience. I mean, learning is not always linear. It's not always comfortable, but in that discomfort, you really learn the best lessons and that's what really makes us who we are. That's amazing. Um, I just want to say one thing, if you guys have Hulu, since we're talking about, um, you mentioned Emmett Till, there's this uh, mini series on Hulu called Women of the Movement inspired by Emmett Till and his mom um, during the whole entire movement and how it really just catapulted the civil rights movement and everything like that. Whenever you guys get the chance, it is an amazing film. I cried, I hardly cry. So when I, when I cry, it lets, me, it lets me know that the actors have done their job. Watch it, it is amazing. Um, so Jalen, <laughs> like, um, yes, leaning into discomfort, that is certainly a thing that everybody needs to um, understand. And, you know, they, they actually, in the beginning of the show, they actually had um, viewer, a viewer discretion uh, note. And 
you know, I think that was needed because it was very hard to swallow. Jalen, your question is, what can states and districts do to ensure that recruiting more black and brown uh, teachers in the classroom? Thank you. I would say there are two steps to this. Um, I would say you have to recruit them and I think it's important to also maintain them. First, we can start with recruiting. There are plenty of programs you can have, but residential teacher programs are really helpful for helping teachers avoid debt, the ability to work and then also attend classes and kind of get that hands-on experience is really essential, especially since um, we find that most predominantly black and brown schools do happen to be on lower, lower income. So really making sure that they can avoid debt, avoid you know, taking on more than they can handle, really gives them the opportunity to be a teacher and explore their, their want and desire to teach. And there is also, I think there are grow your own programs that are really inspiring to see that allow people from their own school communities to become teachers. It can be non-licensed staff members, it could be teacher's assistants, it could be technicians, and it can just be people that are part of the district. And that is so, so, so important just because if someone's going to be teaching you, it definitely should be someone that you know and already have a relationship with and that's already familiar with how your district works and how the students are. The next step, of course, is maintaining. And I would say the main solution is resources. Teachers of color do not escape racism or the influences of that just because they are in a position of what I would call academic authority. They still have to deal with that. They have to deal with the children of people who maybe are not as progressive as they think they are. And by providing them with the resources to deal with that, even if it's just a commitment to advocate for their ability to teach culturally inclusive curriculum, like um, Emmett Till, they are, we're definitely parents who did not want us to teach that, did not want us to read that book, but we did because our principal was kind enough to step, put his foot down and say, listen, this is her classroom. This is important to the English class, this is important for them to know. Just, just that kind of advocacy, that kind of resources, that can definitely be essential to maintaining teachers of color and making sure that they stay teachers. Yeah, I think, oh, sorry. If I can just no, add on. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. If I can just add on, um, the Spanish class that I'm currently in is kind of a hybrid leadership Spanish class. And something that we've been examining a lot is, um, you know, I'm sure that a lot of students in public school are experiencing this, but um, teacher shortages, and that is something that's so important. And a lot of it is what you said, Jalen, like not having enough resources, not feeling supported or cared for by like their admin, but a lot of it too is teacher pay. And like, I think, especially at a school like mine, where we have over 1300 English language learners, where we need bilingual staff members, and in a world where bilingualism is such an asset, we are just not paying teachers enough. We are not paying bilingual folks enough to come and want to be teachers and work with kids in classrooms. Um, and so I think that if we can, you know, just allocate more resources and more funding to make sure that we're training good teachers, we're, we're, we're training teachers that, that have the skills and the abilities to communicate with a diverse student body, um, the better, essentially. So um, I just appreciate all of those thoughts that, that you um, elevated. Jalen, and, and one thing that I'm seeing too is how can students be attracted to teaching? And I think that also goes into pay, you know, especially in North Carolina, um, we're one of the states with the worst record on teacher pay. And I know friends that are interested in becoming teachers and want to seek it out, but they know that they're going to have to make a sacrifice in how much they're being compensated for it. Um, and I don't think that's fair really at all. And I'm sure we can all agree on that because we were just discussing what an impact teachers have made on our lives. And, and we know that there are millions of students across the country who can benefit from a meaningful educator in their life. Um, and we, you know, the more that we can um, eliminate those barriers barriers to becoming a successful teacher, becoming a compassionate teacher, and becoming a well-paid, comfortable teacher who doesn't have to, like, I, I just am thinking my AP Lit teacher this year um, has to work two jobs just to Instacart on the weekends, and that I think just, you know, is for someone who's working with youth in classrooms, um, who's overextending themselves already during the week to then have to go and pick up a side hustle on the weekend um, is pretty egregious in our country in this day and age. So, yeah, definitely the more that we can allocate resources, funding, training to teachers to just develop a positive educational culture and environment, I think the better off we'll be. Absolutely, if I can add on that a little bit, I would say um, teaching, <laughs> simply put, is a very attractive job if you think about it objectively. You 
when students are passionate about something, they can choose to specialize in that and then share that passion with other students. And they have the they have the weekends off, they have summer off, and they they can literally be paid to talk about and teach something that they love. I have a friend who is obsessed with history and literally every every aspect he can he can tell you about Roman architecture, he can tell you about every battle in the in the Civil War and the World War II. And he wanted to be a teacher and then he looked at the pay and he said no. And so I definitely think making um teachers making the the compensation oh Lord, the compensation of teachers representative of the work that they do. They should be treated well, they should have pay, they should not have to Instacart on the weekends and they should not have to pay out of pocket for for textbooks, for for history books, for paper, for notebooks, for students, that should all be handled by the school. So definitely teaching, even for me, looks attractive, but I would have to go the route of being a professor because I do not want to be broke. So again, pay, compensation, and better treatment of our teachers. Love that. Um, now let's move on to, I like to say, my favorite part of what, we, what we're going to talk about. Um, our turn has launched its Truth Ed campaign, an opportunity for students and education stakeholders alike to learn about the importance of culturally inclusive pedagogy. Sid and Jalen, share with us some exciting updates about Truth Ed. Now, Sid, how can students, I have two questions for you, actually. How can students mobilize and culture, around culturally inclusive pedagogy? And if students are interested in learning more about organizing and culturally responsive education, how can they get involved? Definitely, I appreciate that, Tamara. One thing I would say is, um, first of all, our turn has a Truth Ed student pledge, which is authored by real students, real student organizers. And while it is an actual action item that you can take to sign the pledge and to share it with adult allies who can also take the pledge, to me, it's very much a um, symbolic pledge of this is the stance I'm choosing to take around culturally inclusive pedagogy, right? When you sign that, you are pledging to be an interrogator of materials in classrooms and an advocate for culturally inclusive teaching practices and curriculum and, and making sure that the videos you're watching in history class are things that you feel affirm your identity and, and the history that you know is necessary to be taught. So that's definitely one step that students can take is checking out that student pledge and not only signing it, but really putting those practices into play into classrooms. Um, because, you know, I touched on this earlier, although it is the responsibility of, in my opinion, you know, school boards and, and administrators to go to students to seek out their feedback, at the end of the day, we're going to have to be the ones that are advocating for ourselves. So the more that we can sit in classrooms and just say, like, this is what we know to be true, you know, the better. So that's one step that folks can take. Another one is to participate in our turns um, truth ed modules. We currently have three. The last one just passed this past month, and it was um, all about combating misinformation and disinformation critical race theory era uh, and I attended that it was personally super meaningful because I think it's so easy to get caught up in the issue and to have these combat conversations where you're dealing with folks informed on the issue um, but to just sit down and really receive a training and connect with other youth from across the country around how we can come to a common goal to receive the education that we know we deserve um, I think was super meaningful um, another one that we will be doing is this Saturday. I don't know when this podcast will be going out, but um, we have a module this Saturday around engaging with elected officials and candidates. So if you're interested in talking to their school board members about um, book bans or just any kind of equity they're experiencing across the country, like that is the training for you. And then we just have some more programming coming up in the summer, like a student summit where students will be able to come together and connect around issues, receive training, but also just meet and, and kind of align around these common goals. So those are definitely some initial steps that folks can take beyond just, you know, pledging to be an advocate and interrogator and a strong willed student who is not going to stop at anything to ensure that they're receiving the education they deserve. That's great, Sid. Thank you so much for your feedback on that. Jalen, what has been, in your opinion, the most exciting and fulfilling aspect of the Truth Ed campaign? Thank you. I'm so glad you asked. I would say the community. You can get really politically burned out 
you know, when you hear bad thing after bad thing after bad thing, there's another book being banned. There's another legislative proposal to ban the discussion of race or sexuality or, or transgenders. And it's, it can be really, really difficult to hear. It seems like there's always one thing after the other. And it can be hard to keep up the fight when it seems like you're against the entire world. Um, but knowing that there are so many people who are working on the issue, getting small wins across the country can be so, so comforting. And it really gives you that boost you need to keep your own fight going. It's easy to feel like things will never change, but they can and they will. And if we stand together in resistance, it'll happen a lot quicker than it would if we were just silent. The Truth Ed campaign is really the way to do that. It's a way for me to do it. It's a way for you to do it. And it's really a way for anyone who, who wants to do it and stand up and make sure that, like Sid said, we all have a quality education with culturally inclusive curriculum, accurate tellings of history that we all are affected by in some way or another. You all are a breath of fresh air. I love your responses. Like I'm sure the audience will as well. You guys have given amazing feedback and I just, I love everything that you guys talked about. And with all of that being said, thank you both so much for sitting down and speaking with me today about account action, accountable ways decision makers can walk the talk on student engagement. Hearing students is one thing, but elevating their wishes is an entirely different thing. More powerful show of solidarity. We hope hearing from our diverse group of students across these three episodes have been enlightening and empowering and has given you the tools to pursue effective student engagement in the future. For our final closing of this series, it's our turn to be the voice that we want to hear in the world and be the change that we wanna see as well. For more info on our turn student ed, for our turns truth ed, excuse me, campaign and CNCP's Million Teachers of Color campaign, please visit www.itsourturn.org. And thank you all for listening. Um, this is Tamara Morgan sign off with these two beautiful people. <laughs> thank you, our turn, and thank you, TNTP. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for Passing the Mic. We encourage you to keep the conversation going and for you to share your stories with us on social media using the hashtag Passing the Mic TNTP. We look forward to connecting with you during our next conversation. Until then, stay safe.